G'day, I'm Colin Dangard and you're on the Colin Dangard Show with my regular co-host, Jared Williams. We're going to cover some real hot territory today. Oh yeah. Starting with sex. I love sex. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's start with sex before we talk about politics because somehow the two seem to be intertwined and we're going to get to that. But taking a deep dive right into sex, how's your sex life going? Well, it's fantastic. I'm 80, 81 years old, and every night I go to sleep, I wake up and I wake up thinking I'm in a in a shipwreck, holding the mast. But there it goes, and <laughs> it's not a shipwreck. <laughs> well, I understand that that's actually very healthy. It's very healthy to make sure that you still, you know, have that happening. Yeah. Well, I, I've um, me and sex go back a long way. I, I've had just I just adore women. I just love the idea of that intimacy and getting together spirit to spirit of the opposite sex yeah. it's uh, an extraordinary thing and and uh, it's i i really rejoiced today that sex has come much more out in the open than it ever has before oh yeah now we have uh, now we have gays we have people in between we have straight people we have people in between the straight people and the gay people and then people in between those and we can talk about it and yes we can discuss the whole thing and it's really out in the open, which I think is a wonderful thing, because yeah. I don't care if you're male or female, if you're enjoying a sexual relationship. That's extraordinary. Yeah, I think it's absolutely extraordinary. And I also think that it's about time. It's about time that uh, we are no longer chastising, berating, and ridiculing people for what they do in their bedroom, when honestly, it's nobody's business but yours what you do. And if you want to talk about it, then hey, that's your choice, right? And I think uh, young people today are very fortunate because they're growing up and, and their parents actually are talking to them about it. This is a very common thing. Yeah. Uh, they talk about the birds and the bees. Well, we, we, were, we were already uh, running through the tobacco fields with nubile nymphets. As, there it goes again. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, it didn't... Um, today, it happens much earlier and people are willing to talk about it and parents talk to their kids about it. But the idea of... Uh, of having relationships is just extraordinary. It's been shown uh, clinically and uh, medically that the fewer friends you have, the shorter your life will be. I believe it. And the fewer intimate friends you have, the shorter your life will be. We exist as a, as a tribe. We have to have a handle on other people next to us and we've got to feel one of the tribe. We do not operate alone. We're not a lone creature. We're not like that uh, eagle you see soaring up there and he's alone and he sees something and he dives in and grabs it. And, but that's an eagle. We're not like that at all. Um, we have a, a five million years we've been around and, uh, and we've been around because uh, we like being with each other uh, more than we like being with any other animal. And we're an animal after all. Uh, but our animal is, uh, it's, it's based, its structure and its tribal structure and its social structure is based on associations with other people. Mm -hmm. 100%. And you know, right now, uh, the political landscape has almost centered on abortion. Again, I can't believe we're back here. And that's a woman's right to choose. If they have a sexual encounter, um, that is a permissible situation where they acknowledge that encounter. Perhaps contraception isn't used, and perhaps there's an accident. They might be forced to have to go to another state to, to have an abortion. Um, there are people that are potentially very dangerous people that are utilizing this uh, situation, this this political argument over uh, abortion to to come to power again and I feel like it's really living leave, sorry leaving a woman's choice out of the picture which I just don't understand I don't know what you feel about yes that. well I think that basically I think it's another attempt to control women uh, and that is uh, uh, just control their bodies say what they can and can't do with their bodies but that's outrageous that puts us back to the beginning of time. It really does. And, and isn't it true that like one of the biggest risks to a woman's 
health is pregnancy. Like, I mean, back in the day, pregnancy killed a certain percentage of women almost every time. Well, it was up like uh, 25%. It used to be 100 years ago. And it's slipped down now to maybe 5 or 3%. Really? But there's a lot of... Uh, uh, there's a, a lot of alternatives today, and you know, contraception is, of course, a, a great thing, and that's wonderful. But there are mistakes, and things happen, and um, the moment gets carried away, and um, our our physical and emotional interaction with the opposite sex is uh, it's very powerful, and it uh, causes people to do make make mistakes, to make the wrong decisions, and that's just it. But I think what's fascinating today is <clears throat> how uh, all the barriers have come down everywhere. Uh, one time to be gay was considered you're a freak or something, mm -hmm. but now that's considered okay. They're just gay or or, <laughs> or transgender people, well, yeah. and, and they were they were like circus. They were in the circus, you know. Oh yeah. Uh, but now they're like walking around the street and they they're considered normal, um, and that's uh, I think that's the biggest. Uh, challenge and the biggest wake-up call that America has had in the positive. But uh, we also have lots of problems in this country and I think uh, if you start at the top of the list of who, what the problems are, I think it has to be fentanyl number one. Oh yeah. There's uh, 350,000 people a year die of fentanyl. Can you believe that? That's outrageous. 350,000, that that's, that's like a, a small city. Every year they go out. And uh, and it's getting worse and worse. Um, the other thing is that all of this is happening at a time we've uh, defunded our police and uh, more or less run the sheriff out of town at a time when we most need the sheriff. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a breakdown of law and order. So you're getting more and more uh, mass shootings and uh, things that make the country look like it's out of control. My opinion on that is, why don't we re-educate the police, the sheriff, as opposed to getting rid of them or, you know, reducing the amount of that protection that we have? Why don't we re-educate them on what is appropriate conduct and what is inappropriate conduct instead of losing that security? I think that's a very, very important point there, Jared. It's <clears throat> the, uh, the basic fact is, if you took away all the police tomorrow... You couldn't walk anywhere. You couldn't go anywhere. You'd be mugged, hijacked, shot, uh, cut up. You'd be you'd be dead. Oh yeah. The only thing that makes uh, makes America halfway safe is our police, and yep. they are under severe challenges all the time. And I think that's very bad. I, I'm I don't like police, especially if I see them on my rear view mirror and they, <laughs> and, they and they got the lights going and uh, here goes another ticket for speeding or something like right, that. Right. But uh, he's just doing his job. If 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 you don't obey the laws and you shouldn't be driving and the, and the, the, getting a ticket is, is society's way of telling you well uh, obey the law will you because lots of other people on the road and uh, <clears throat> you know you can get killed in a car very easily oh yeah oh yeah and we need them around i mean like uh the other day i was driving down the street and uh this lady slammed into my car and took out my um taillight and then I chased her down the street. Um, I took a picture of the license plate. I sent it to the police department, and they said, I'm sorry, this happens all the time. There's nothing we can do. We've, our funding has gone down. We don't have as many police officers to react to these situations, so take care of it yourself. Not just with vehicles. It's, uh, in California now, you can go into any department store and steal and put it in your bag whatever items you want to steal. As long as it doesn't exceed $999, right. it's not a crime. Yep. Can you believe that? I can't believe that because I work with a lot of the brands I work with um, in grocery stores, and I see people carrying out bags of stuff, and of course, like, you know, staff members are chasing them out of the store, but once they get out of the store, you can call the police if you want to, but if it's not over a certain amount of money, they don't even respond. No, they, they don't want anything to do with it. It'll probably take them four hours to get there. But yeah. this is to do with the breakdown of society that we're right. seeing. Uh, the only reason that people used to not do crime was because of the consequences. You'd get arrested, you'd go to jail, and that wouldn't be nice. But yeah. now the chances of getting arrested and going to jail are less and less and less, which brings me to our political situation. There are lots of people who 
ought to be in jail, but are not. Yes, absolutely. And I think I know exactly who we're talking about. Um, you know, I was just talking to my dad uh, earlier before, you know, before we uh, got together to do this podcast. And he was saying that Donald Trump is the he he, he he's documented as being one of the biggest verifiable liars that the world has ever seen and the only presidential candidate that's ever had so many lawsuits against him um, that eventually will come out and, and not in his favor. It just depends on whether or not he's actually president at the time, if that happens. Wouldn't it be extraordinary if he elected a president who happened to be in jail at the time? <laughs> That'd be amazing. It's, it's not the Oval Room, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> it's not the Oval Office. It's a, <laughs> Here is the President of the United States from his cell. My fellow Americans, it's the greatest cell that the greatest jail has ever given a, a person that's president. Well, that's never happened before, but that's okay. But it's happening now, and here we are. I've got a bunkmate. His name is Bubba. Come on over here, Bubba. Say hi. We had a great night, Bubba and I, last night. I can't talk about it, but it was a great night. It was all I could get. I mean... <laughs> It could happen. <laughs> it really, really could yeah. happen. I think it's outrageous. The presidential jail cell. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, the, 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 one of the problems I see is that, <laughs> is that there's, no, there's no barrier anymore between uh, conservatives and liberals. I mean, it's, it's like it's all a gray area. Everything's yeah. gray. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like uh, Colin... I was, I was saying to my dad, I was like, you know, when they pull Democrats and they say, how do you feel about Joe Biden? How do you feel about Donald Trump? A lot of them are saying, I don't know. I feel that uh, uh, Joe Biden should have uh, not uh, wanted to do a reelection campaign, that he should have, you know, dropped out, threw his hat in there, because at some point he's not making sense anymore. Um, but he's just, he's so stubborn. You know, and then you got this other guy, Trump. I think when it comes down to it, people are obviously not going to go in the direction of becoming Russia. You have a choice to make. Are you going to, do you want to be Russia or do you want to be America? Right? That's the choice that they have to make. But it's so sad that it's gotten to this point where we're, we're, we're trying to decide between two blubbering idiots. Well, it's uh, <clears throat> not that Joe, Joe's an idiot. I'm just saying that, like, well, he's it's just he's old. He should be in a rocking chair on on the steps on the yeah. stage. And sh and, so should Donald. Yeah, Trump. And, and they should yeah. be talking to each other and saying, "Well, we had a good run, didn't we, Donald? <laughs> yes, mm, yes, we had a great run. Yes, um, it's uh, um, but it also is a a little bit of a setback for people of age. It's made people of age uh, look bad, if you ask me. I uh, think you should run for president, actually, <laughs> Colin, because you make more sense than both of these guys <laughs> times five. Well, <laughs> I well, I, and uh, the fact I do, it's uh, it's amazing because I've had nine concussions. I sh my doctor looks at my chart and he says, you know, you should be dead. And I said, well, maybe I am. I'm just walking around here looking alive. <laughs> That's a science project right there. <laughs> <laughs> but in my case, it came from uh, uh, too many crashes or forces when I... I, reg I regret the crashes, but I don't regret the thrill of doing it. Yeah. Because I believe that everybody should face danger regularly. You should scare yourself half to, half to death as mm -hmm. regularly as you can. Don't do it on a car on the freeway because that's no good. You possibly could involve other people. Right. But do it yourself. Uh, yeah. Just where you are concerned. Then, uh, in my case, me and a horse, but I must say I've... I've had nine concussions with my adventures on horses and I haven't, haven't hurt a single horse. But they have four legs. We only have two. That's if, a good point. If we stumble, we fall. If right. a horse stumbles, it just gets up. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't go down. It takes a lot to get a you horse You've got to take out all four legs to get me down. <laughs> but, you know, speaking about risk, I mean, like, uh, what is the big risk about Nikki Haley? I mean, I see her as being quite moderate. And I don't know much about Nikki Haley, but we were talking about Nikki Haley, she, I think, is kind of getting close to being the runner-up to Donald Trump as far as the primary is concerned right now. Um, I don't hate her. Uh, what do you think? Well, I like Nikki a lot. I'm uh, right, right now, right today, she has my vote. Okay, that's for sure, uh, because she makes a lot of sense. She's moderate. She's not one way or the other. 
which is down the middle of the road, which happens to be where three quarters of Americans are. Wow. There's only extremists yeah. on the left and extremists on the right, but right. that big swathe of, swathe, swathe of people down through the center, that's America. Mm -hmm. And that's most of the people. Yeah. And that's who Nikki Haley represents, in my view. She's very articulate. She knows what she, she knows what's going to be good for the country, uh, and uh, she's not an embarrassment when she gets up and speaks. You know, we have Joe Biden on the one hand forgetting his lines. Well, that's okay. He's a bit old. Then we have uh, um, Donald Trump, who you wish he forgot his lines, but he doesn't. <laughs> 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 So, but, but Nikki I'm going to throw myself under the bus, okay? Because <laughs> he does. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, whatever happens in the upcoming elections, it's going to be really, really interesting. It's the great American <clears throat> circus. Oh, yeah. It's the great American soap opera. Yeah. And you've got people like um, Liz Cheney that are talking about Antifa. Antifa, what that stands for is anti-fascist. So if you were fighting in World War II, you would be anti-fascist, which would be you would be anti-Nazi, and that's what you were fighting for. And now she's trying to make this suggestion that there's this anti-Semitism going on within the left, uh, which doesn't make any sense. And, you know, she's supposed to be the voice of the, I don't, I hate to use the word woke, but the voice of the anti-Trump Republican Party, which well, really is just the Republican Party. Yes, it doesn't subscribe course. to this bullshit. Yeah. And she's, She's she's in all the media right now. You can't escape her. And I'm like, what is this woman talking about? Yeah. And why is she getting more screen time than Nikki Haley? That's what I want to know. Yeah, right. She's not even running for president. <laughs> well, again, it's um, it's uh, there's a big blurring of uh, of the political frontier in America today, as indeed there is in the entire international frontier. You know, you have uh, Putin, for example, his biggest biggest uh, outcry was and his biggest thing was how Russians defeated the Nazis coming into Russia and, uh, and how, right. how, how he really crushed the Nazis. Well, he's doing the same thing. He's invading Ukraine. He's doing what Hitler did. Hitler invaded right. other countries. And he's Putin doing the same thing. And he wants to knock off Ukraine so he can move on to, well, he's already done Crimea, but knock yeah. off Ukraine and keep going to Western, to Eastern Europe. And uh, he's, he's on a path that Hitler's on. So isn't it strange mm -hmm. that he claims that the greatest thing Russia ever did in, in living memory was defeat Hitler. And he's doing exactly the same thing. Uh, if Oppenheimer, uh, if you guys have seen um, the Oppenheimer film, great. If you haven't seen it, watch it. Um, what you'll learn is that Russia was only six months away from um, having refined and developed the ability to actually launch an H-bomb which would be five times more powerful than the A-bomb, which is what we had gotten uh, through Einstein and Oppenheimer and other things like that. Um, if they had gotten to the H-bomb before we got to the A-bomb, we might all be speaking Russian. This might all be a complete non-issue at this point. But what... Uh, be like, uh, dos vedon, yes. <laughs> like, But the serious... Colon. The serious... A problem in overview for the world today is the number of countries that have nuclear weapons that they can launch. There's like 12 of them right now. Yeah, how did we get to that? Was that well, ever we, part of the plan to have this? Like, what countries developed it on their own without anyone else's help or approval? And they're like, guess what? We have it. I don't well, know. We, we helped them enormously in the beginning because they were on our side. But as soon as they got the big one, yeah. uh, then they, they said, well, we don't need America. We'll, we'll, we'll be on a, we'll just be an independent So we'll country. use our oil money to buy this technology. Yes. And once we have it and we're not on your side anymore, we'll be like, ha ha, just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> now, now you're, now you're looking at now us. Now who's boss? Yes. Right. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what it's, you um, think that's what happened with Iran? I mean, because yes. I just, well, we, they make we, it seem like they aren't buying anything from, from allied countries, uh, from, from members of the United Nations and stuff like that in order to refine what they already have. But I just don't see how in the middle of the desert you can get that kind of shit. 
No, well, <laughs> we, we, we supplied the arms in the beginning. Right. And then, then from that, they got scientists and built on what we supplied them. America has been the biggest arms manufacturer in the world until now when Russia exceeds us in the, in the manufacturing of arms because right. they're devoting their entire uh, economy to it much more than we are. Right. Our, our, our expenditure on, uh, on military is less than 2%. In Russia, it's pushing 6%, 8%. Wow. And yeah. chi China's up with 4%. So we are we are we are going down a scale on uh, on what we can do, but for what, for the first the danger is for the first time in man's history we have enough nuclear power to blow up the world literally. Right. If every if uh, Russia launches a launched a missile uh, a nuclear bomb at us, we'd launch one at them automatically. It'd probably pass in the sky. Mm -hmm. uh, so there'd be ex exchange of heavy nuclear. Then everybody else would get into it. There'd be enough nuclear fallout to fire the rim around the Earth. That uh, that um, the, that b those big rings you see around the Earth. That's uh, that's hydrogen. Mm -hmm. and nitrogen, and uh, and it's that could blow up. If that blew up, the whole world would blow up, and that'd be the end of us. Right. There'd be a lot of co cockroaches left, I guess. That's what they say is going to be left on the earth when everything else goes. Just a humble cockroach. That's yeah. extraordinary. Isn't it? Or the lead singer of the Rolling Stones. Which is, <laughs> they're on tour, by the way. I just found out about this. The, the Rolling Stones are back on tour. Uh, what is that? Mick Jagger. Yeah. And then the guy from ACDC. Real life cockroaches, dude. Nothing can kill them. <laughs> They've done every drug. <laughs> it's it's amazing. But uh, you're right. Yeah, cockroaches would be left. It's uh, what they call mutually assured security in some sense. Um, but it's politicized. Uh, so much, and it's hard to know exactly who can do more first. Well, one good thing America has done, and Biden has done, is um, he's he's armed, he's made arms available to the to to fight Russia's advance on Ukraine. Right. He's armed the he's, he's armed Ukraine very well, so they have something to fight with. Uh, because, but he's been a bit of a like a typical Democrat. He's been a bit of a pussy, right? Because, yes. because if he had only given them what they asked for from the get go, then they would have been able to uh, advance a lot faster. And now it's become this stalemate, sort of war of attrition kind of a thing. Well, where they have like the tiger's teeth or whatever you call it, and they have all the mines laid out. And it's like, dude, wh why didn't we train them on the F 16s when they wanted to be trained, knowing that it would take at least 48 months before they were able to operate that aircraft in the first place. Yeah, it's a, a, one of the tragedies. We gave them just enough to hold on, and that's what right. we gave them. And, uh, well, there uh, wasn't a lot of Republican support, honestly, no, and for some reason. Which and, is, and there's so, less. it's getting less and less support today as we speak. Yeah, apparently um, uh, Vladimir Putin sent a thank you letter to Mitch McConnell, the mi minority leader of the Senate, our Senate, say, saying thank you for holding back aid to the Ukraine when it comes to weapons and when it comes to humanitarian purposes. Yeah, well, it's uh, uh, but, when, when, but when you think about it, Russia has been America's number one enemy for almost half a century. Mm -hmm. They've hated us from the beginning, and and we've made overtures to them. But uh, in the end, they they knocked us down anyhow. I like Russians. I think the women are beautiful. They're fantastic, gorgeous women. All of my wives are Russian. I mean, or uh, some other like you know territory of Russia, <laughs> Belarus women. You know, I like Russian people. I think they're funny. You know, I dated a Hungarian person once. It's like diet Russian. I mean, but like. I, but I don't know that they like us that much. And, and I, I guess it's just because they live in the society like, like North Koreans do or like a lot of Chinese do where we are enemy number one and that's all they hear and that's all they see, so that's all they know. Well, it's propaganda wars. Uh, you know, they, used to, they used to fight wars with bullets and tanks, but that's pretty much taken a back seat to mm -hmm. today's war. Today's war is propaganda. And yeah. who's, got the, who, who can, who's got the highest hill to shout from? to get your 
to get your propaganda across. and hacking and and the ability and cyber hacking and in cyber wars where they could just turn the lights off on los angeles for like two weeks or something yeah well they could do yeah and uh, i'm i got no doubt they're thinking about how to do it well i'm pretty sure that they're they try and fail <laughs> you know what i mean but it's not like the effort isn't there yeah, we don't hear about what failed and what didn't fail. No, that's not really news, is it? No. <laughs> Somebody has to be successful. But then on, uh, you know, it's not just the Russians. Now we have the Chinese, which are making big strides. Uh, they're dominating all the South Pacific and mm-hmm. uh, all those islands. And they, they, get, they get their eye on Australia. They want to take Australia out. They want to take New Zealand. Who would take uh, Australia? Australia is my favorite place in the world. I've been there three <laughs> times. I love the people more than any other people. Um, and that's just, oh, my God, that's sad. I, uh, talk Especially about, when Australia lost more people in World War II than any other country. Yes, for sure. And they did. No, like, talking about World War Two, uh, the uh, the Japanese, uh, of course, had their eye on Australia, and they actually landed in Australia up in the Northern Territory. They landed a platoon, and uh, it's a funny story. But uh, what did they get wiped out right away? No, they you know, imagine landing up there, and it's desolate. There's nothing. And there they are on their landing craft. Is that over by the Sundays, like way up there? No, no, it's on the other side. Oh, the, by yeah, Perth. Right? Yeah, okay. no, up north of Perth. North up of in, Perth. Yeah, up in the Northern Territory. So the a, um, a Japanese platoon came across, and the story goes that they walked into the, walked into the wilderness, into the you know, jungly and horrible. And, and let me guess, you were there. <laughs> 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 I wish I had been there, but as the, sto- as the story goes... A spear just goes... <laughs> <laughs> but I was that- just trying to get a wallaby. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Who are you? I don't recognize you. You guys look different. <laughs> <laughs> but could you imagine these Japanese there? They, they, they got all their guns and they're walking, <laughs> they're walking, through, the, walking through the jungle. <laughs> and You're in a loincloth. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I took notice of the Aboriginals. That's for sure. <laughs> but uh, the, as the story goes, uh, the, the Japanese commander walks through, and out from behind a tree uh, jumps an Aboriginal with a spear. Okay. And he's just wearing a loincloth. He's got a spear, and he says, "Stick him up. All the same. Hop along, Cassidy." <laughs> 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 That's a true story, <laughs> because <laughs> because on our, on our cattle property we amuse the Aboriginals by hanging up a clothesline on uh, running a wire between two trees and hanging up a clothesline, and getting mm-hmm. one of those old sixteen millimeter projectors and running uh, running cowboys and Indian movies. With <laughs> 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 so he thought that this was just another thing. You got out and you said, "Stick them up, all the same, like hop along." Cassidy. He's like Kobayashi. Where are we? What have we done? <laughs> But uh, Australia would be a pretty difficult place to take over. I would think so. Although the the Chinese want to. Mm. Why they want to, it's beyond me. What they could do with it is beyond me because the people people living there don't know what to do with it. (laughs) And they can can barely live it. (laughs) Right. And, uh, you know, because it's such a desolate, rough, hard country. And uh, America, by comparison, is paradise. We have water from one coast to the other, except for a few desert pieces. We we actually have people in the middle of this country. Like in Australia, it's all mostly coastal towns. Yes, it's all coastal. And I've been through Canberra and through the Blue Mountains, and like there's just this massive part that's just completely desolate. Yeah, and people go missing there all the time. It's one of those things. Yeah. There's uh, lots of stories about people who go for a swim and Swim out there, don't come back. <laughs> Nobody knows where they went. <laughs> it's it's a it's a rough place. America, by comparison, is just paradise. I mean, when well, the population of uh, Australia, I think, is like something around twenty eight, twenty nine million, and yeah. by comparison, the population of California is like thirty eight million. So imagine, like, the population of California. Versus Australia is and Australia is by landmass. Yeah, and Australia has the same continental landmass as America. Exactly. So all of if you took all of the people out of uh, out of California, you you might fill Australia mm-hmm. with it, but that's it. Mm-hmm. But it take all of Australia to do it. Yeah, uh, which makes them a very um, interesting people, um, in that they 
they've always had a hard life. It's not been easy in Australia, whereas America, America's just blessed with its, uh, with its easiness of life. America enjoys a standard of living that's, that's not even close to the next person in the world, in the next country in the world. Yeah. We are, in fact, the Roman Empire. Right. Which brings us to something else. You know, we all know what happened to the Roman Empire. Here we go. Then, uh, in it, uh, yep. you know, there are some there are some cracks in it. There's some cracks in the empire. There are. And uh, uh, and we, you have to wonder what, how the young people are going to handle this, and what they're going to do to virtually save save our country. How good and do so you feel about the the next generation? My nephews are, I think now, God, fourteen and. 17, uh, f uh, 13 and 14, and then I got a 17 year old niece. What do you think their life is going to look like over the next 50, 60 years of their life so far? Well, I think it's going to be a huge challenge, and I wonder if they are equipped enough for it. Me Remember, our, our forefathers uh, fought in trenches just like, the, uh, just like the, they're doing now in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. a horrible place to be in a trench being. Uh, have, having everybody throw stuff at you and and flames fly, going everywhere and rats rats big enough to bite your foot off, you know that's 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 warfare and oddly enough that's what's happening here today. Why have people become so desensitized to the horror and the tragedy of this war? Women and children are dying every day in Ukraine. We did not give them what they needed when they needed it. And now it might be too late and it might be giving the upper hand to China and to Russia and their sympathizers. So if we're, if we're talking about the, the next generation, I mean, to prevent something like this from happening again would be to prevent it from happening right now. Yes, we should be moving now. It's I, so sad. Like it, people were sympathetic to what was happening to to the Jewish people in Germany, and they wanted to fight. Every American almost wanted to fight to stop that from happening. Now this is happening in the Ukraine, and people are like, "Well, I don't know. I hear this on the, you know in the news. I hear that in the paper. I hear this on a podcast. So I don't know because it doesn't affect me." I'm a globalist in the sense that when I know that people are, are dying for no reason, I, I want to do something about it. I don't pretend like I don't care. Well, you have to remember one thing, Jared, that uh, since the beginning of time, man has been a killer. We kill each other. Right. We've killed each other since the beginning, the very beginning. So all of the, all of the stuff we hear now about these tremendous wars and terrible suffering all over the world, well, it's nothing new. That's been the modus operandi of man since the beginning of so time. So we've become more and more desensitized. More and more desensitized, okay. correct. And and this has all happened with an incredible flood of knowledge. Uh, something can happen in Ukraine and we hear about it within hours, within two hours. Right. In the old days, you had to wait for a sailing ship to arrive and that would take them three months to get from Europe to here and then somebody would tell you what was happening in Europe. Right. That was... So now... Now you, you have to wonder, is all of this happening as the way it's always happened, as it's always happened, but now we just hear about it more and more and more. We hear about everything, which, uh, which I think is, uh, plays a, a, a heavy load, places a heavy load on the mental health of modern man. I think one reason people get depressed is they look out and they hear about this, they turn on the TV and they all they get is re re uh, uh, reels of people shooting and killing each other. Well, of course it gets depressing. And I think that's one, one reason that depression is such on the rise here. Mm -hmm. And one reason that uh, uh, a good way to relieve uh, depression is to take drugs. So we have mm -hmm. uh, a drug culture that's, that's out of control. Yeah, and uh, it's that's yeah. really a sad thing. Yeah, we have a we have a drug problem that's out of control. Um, it, it does desensitize people, and it it does make people just want to, you know, focus on the party and focus on enjoying themselves and not concern themselves with world issues that they could easily be uh, helpful within, with their votes and with their money and whatnot. Um, it, they just turn around and want to party. But, you know, one really great alternative 
to uh, alcohol, at least, is this brand that I've been working with called Three Spirit, which oh, we yeah. actually I've, have right I've here. I've had some of that. That's, yeah. that's good. So, I like it. And, and what I, so what Three Spirit is, if you go to drinkspirit.com, um, uh, this is a botanical, a nootropic, and adaptogen drink that pretty much mimics the effects of alcohol that you want. You know, the euphoria, the feeling of being social, the feeling of being lowering your stress while increasing your energy at the same time and there's no downside and it's actually totally good for you you could have it whenever you want um this one is called livener three spirit livener energized juicy fiery mm -hmm. like my personality um and it's a botanical alcohol alternative a fruity fiery elixir powered by guayusa shisandra ancient berries and roots that tribes have been using for a long time for their party moments before alcohol was even ever introduced to them. Um, and um, it has vibrant berries, bright aromatics, and heat for lively euphoric vibes. This is what the kids are starting to, to uh, glom onto right now. That's a hell of a thing. That's you don't have a hangover. You don't throw up. Nobody's going to get into a fight because they had too much three-spirit that night. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'd love to give you an example of what it tastes like. Um, I don't know. Have you had live? Yeah, yet? I've had that one. Oh, okay. I've yeah. had this one too. Yeah. So this one has a bit of caffeine in it. Um, this one's social actually is powered by Damiana. Damiana is a um, aphrodisiac. Colin, hey. <laughs> um, and uh, so, yeah, as, as we're continuing to talk, I'll just give you an example. But the point is, is that there are alternatives to alcohol that are out there that don't cause as many problems. And I'm so grateful to be part of the yeah. three spirit movement. Well, when you when you think of uh, alcohol as being one of one of man's greatest things and one of man's worst things, uh, yeah. it's amazing that something like alcohol could be t uh, a devil and a, a devil and a savior at the same time. When sailing ships went to Australia, Cheers. the only thing that kept them afloat was alcohol. Yeah, the, the convict ships. The only thing that kept the convicts in any kind of shape was alcohol. No, I yeah. heard I heard that um, Nazi Germany that they were actually giving soldiers like some sort of methamphetamine to keep them awake and keep them angry and keep them fighting longer and that's kinda like where Well they invented uh, meth they invented meth. Oh is that right? Okay that's they, what I thought. That's where it comes from, the Nazis. Uh, <clears throat> and it's you know, I, I lived in Hong Kong for when the Vietnam War was on. Mm -hmm. And that was that was flooding flooding with drugs. And of course, uh, I was uh, tw twenty years old, nineteen years old, and so this is good. <laughs> so I, I, got, I got into it, I got into it big time. But then I started to realise that I couldn't function, and uh, I wanted to function better. But drugs just prevented it. It were not the same. Yeah. So I just quit and never never did any any drugs ever again. But it was a good ex a good experiment at the time. Mm -hmm. I did have, even like all Australians, I have enjoyed drinking, but I stopped that about 15 years ago, and uh, now I don't do anything. I'm boring as hell, <laughs> except I'll screw He is up. not boring <laughs> as hell. Uh, let's talk about soft white underbelly, may I? <laughs> okay, so for those of you that don't know, but if you're watching our show, you probably do, soft white underbelly is a very compelling podcast on YouTube, and basically it looks at really interesting people, people that have gone through drug addiction, people that have um, had horrible things happen to them that are still surviving with it today, and people that have lived the most legendary life, like Colin. Colin went on the show, uh, and it was just released a couple days ago, and got 75,000 views in just 48 hours, and it's going up and up and up as we speak right now. The comments are over 430, most of them asking, where is there more stories uh, uh, where's Colin's stories? Uh, can I get to his podcast? And we're giving them that option. Tell me about this. I mean, like, what was it like to to not just do that show, but then to realize about a week later that it's one of the most popular trending podcasts that they've ever done? Yeah, I didn't. Um, I didn't realize how popular it was. <laughs> I, I, I don't watch television. I read books a lot. I used to have a soft white underbelly, but I got older, <laughs> and now it's a little. I have to shave it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the host of the show, uh, I down in Santa Monica, I walk in the door and he's got it all set up to shoot. And, I, and he says, well, he says, uh, just tell stories. I says, how, much, how long do you want me to talk? How much time do you have? And he says, you can talk as long as you like. I says, 
you'll be here for 24 hours. I said, no, I wouldn't repeat myself. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I rattled on for about an hour straight. And uh, I w didn't have a watch. I wasn't watching the time. But I, then I gave it out and said, well, that's it. Thanks for having me on the Soft White Underbelly. Great show. And gave him an out. And he looked at his watch and says, I don't believe that. He says, that's... Uh, that's a, an, hour, an hour and five minutes. <laughs> I was I was looking at some of the comments and people were saying like, Colin is the most interesting man I've ever listened to. Where can I find more of him? Colin's stories I could listen to all day long. I love Colin's stories. I love watching him. Another one said, Colin is really sexy. He's a hot man. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get a number on that one? <laughs> <laughs> should I, I? I should ask for one, right? Yeah. <laughs> Another one said, "I just bought his signed copy of his book, which you can buy Colin's book if you go to colindangard.com. That's C O L I N D A N G A A R D dot com. Colindangard.com. You can buy Colin's book and get a signed copy from Colin, right? Correct." Um, yeah, I'd, so people I'd, are asking for that. Uh, the soft white underbelly uh, fans and viewers are asking, uh, they're telling us that they bought your book or saying that they, and they're even saying like, oh my God, you need to buy his book. Yeah, well, uh, uh, I've only ever written one novel, but I've written uh, millions of words, that's for sure, but mostly short stories and uh, endless articles and stuff like that. But uh, I, one day I said to myself, I should write a novel. Uh -huh. So I had no idea what I was going to do, what the story was going to be. And so I just started thinking, you know, I think, well, what's interesting to me? And what's interesting to me is being able to talk with horses. Mm -hmm. And I can talk with horses and they talk to me. Uh, probably because I'm at their intellectual level. That's pretty good. They, uh, so we, <laughs> we don't strain each other. <laughs> so... So it's <laughs> <laughs> so. So I, I started writing a book called "Talking with Horses," mm -hmm. and uh, I said, "Well, you got to have a bit of romance in this." So I had a girl, and of course she had a she had she had a a girl a, a girl oh, she, 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 just she, one and she <laughs> and she had a lover. But I thought, well, it's got to have some fighting in it. So I said, "Got to get a till of the hunt into this somewhere." So <laughs> so then I gave her. I made her autistic so she could go from real life to a fantasy life where she fell in love with the lieutenant of the Attila. So I did get everything I wanted in that novel. And, uh, and, I, th and I thought, well, no, maybe, uh, maybe young girls might want to read this because it's mm -hmm. romantic. But oddly enough, who likes it is adult men. Uh -huh. They like reading it, mm -hmm. which, hmm, I wonder about that. <laughs> so let me ask you this. Like, um, you, when did you release this book? I released it first about uh, nine years ago, the okay. first copy of it. Uh, but then um, uh, a few years after that, my wife got seriously ill and I <clears throat> nursed her for like four or five years, as you remember. You came and supported me during that time. and right. It was an interesting time to actually lose everything you have, including the woman I loved. The love of your life. The love of my life. I was losing my business design saddles and sell saddles and losing that and losing the house that I that I built and right. uh, everything was being lost but it's uh, and I was holding her hand and uh, I'd tickle her and make her laugh and do all that stuff and and I thought well you know it's all worth it if I can get another 10 minutes with the lady I love before she dies that it'd be all worth it just to have all this cost if the cost is losing everything to spend another 10 minutes with her that's great but it also and when she died i held her hand and told her i loved her and she squeezed my hand a little bit just faintly looked at me and smiled and died and i thought if death is a if if that's death that's the most beautiful death i've ever seen in my life wow and that is something to celebrate the beauty of that, right? Yeah, well, it's, it's that thing we were talking about. It's that relationship between men and women, or between men and men, for that matter, and women and women. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> the Roman Empire was, was built on men loving men. The, all the warriors were what we'd call today gay, but they were hardly gay. They were swinging swords and 
and killing people and right. you know, pathological killers. They were just extraordinary. Right. So, um, yes, but the, the love between a man and a woman in a traditional sense, mm -hmm. to me, and I'm a very heterosexual. That's your experience. That's my experience, yeah. and I think... If you and that's are, most people's experience. Yeah, really but if is. you are fortunate to find another human being that you love, regardless of their sex, if you love them and you're that fortunate, you are very blessed on this planet because it appears to be not too much. Yeah. Thank you, Jared, for joining us here. Yeah, man, I, I'm always happy to join you every chance I get. Um, and we have a lot more in store for you. We're launching a new season, so get ready for uh, some snippets about what that's going to be like. There are more guests coming on board all the time. And uh, as far as the political situation goes, what I'd like to say is vote your conscience, not your pocketbook. All right. We have enough money to survive uh, with our basic needs in this great country of ours. Your conscience and standing up for what's right is what will make the difference for the future generations of which we are all responsible for. Right. And my and my command is vote, vote. 100% vote and get out there and be active. Thank you so much, Colin, as always. Thank I you, love Jared. you. Great, mate. I love you. All there was time, beyond time and space, a pleasure forever. I look for you.